Oh, I can feel redemption on the way. Forgiveness like the tides rolling in. Taking up the space for shame and sin.
Saints of God, let's stand and sing and praise and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.
it's time for the sleeper to wake. It's time for the old winds to change. I hear the Spirit say it's time. For the dead man to rise, it's time for the great light to shine. I hear the Spirit say it's time. Fling wide the heavenly gates, let the King of Glory in. Let the King of Glory in, come right in on your people's grace. Let the King of Glory in, let the King of Glory in. It's time for the sleeper to wake. It's time for the old winds to change. Oh, I hear the Spirit say it's time. It's time for the dead man to rise. It's time for the great light to shine. Oh, I hear the Spirit say it's time.
you know, I don't want to lose this moment. It says, for where the Lord is, it is holy. And before we sing, let the, law, let, the, let the Lord in. And you know, you need to ask yourself this morning, am I going to let the Lord into my life? Maybe just not as a savior, maybe as a Lord, but you know, as a best friend. See, we get to choose, are we going to let the light or the Lord into our lives? And I promise you, if you and I will do that, then we won't be on holy ground. Because what makes that ground holy is the presence of the Lord. I don't care if you're at school. I don't care if you're at work. I don't care if you're in the car. I don't care if you're on the field of athletics. If you'll let the Lord in right where you're at, it can be holy ground. See, the Lord said, open up the windows and let the light in. And let the light out. Let it out and let it in. You know, our, our, our world needs to see the light of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that you and I, as followers of Christ, are the light to the world. So I'm going to encourage you this week. Will you open up the windows and let the light in and then also let the light out? Let people see that where you're at, you're not a holier-than-thou person. You're just a holy person because the presence of Jesus lives and resides within you. Amen. You may be seated. We thank you, Jesus. Worship team, yeah, you can be seated. We're grateful. We're grateful that you came today to worship with us. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. You know, uh, God is so good to us. You know, and I just I just have some quick announcements I want to give to you before we, we pray for our kids. And, and we're going to start this week. We're going to start on the first name of God, uh, Jehovah Jireh, okay? But uh, we're going to have a, a picnic, a church gathering, kind of out at the, out at the uh, Ponca State Park at 3 o'clock. We're better for, at the West Pavilion or West Shelter. When you come into the state park, you take that, that immediate left turn and then go down that road, and you'll see a bunch of people running around, I'm sure. You'll need a, probably either a day pass or you can get a year pass. I don't even know if anybody will be at the booth, okay? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, okay? But, but we'd love to have you come there at 3 o'clock. we got a really good group of people coming. Uh, the hot dogs are going to be furnished. The chips are going to be furnished. Uh, the... The, yeah, s'mores, we're going to have s'mores, we're going to have, uh, well, I'll bring coffee for you coffee drinkers, hot chocolate for you hot chocolate drinkers, okay, uh, and then uh, we were in Cedar Rapids this past weekend, and the church where, uh, uh, where Merrill's father used to pastor at, they get all these things, uh, I, I think it's once a week they get something from Panera Bread, and they're going to just throw them away, so they give them to the church and they hand them out, and we have some really, really low calorie, low fat uh, pastries down there, cherry things, you know, and, and so we're going to have those there for you, and we're just going to have a good time. I mean, look, at the sun is shining. It's going to be 30. Uh, Ron is going to have a fire going down there, so we'll have something going on down there, you know, uh, so I really invite you to come out if you'd like to at 3 o'clock, okay, and uh, I want to, uh, uh, Doug Spring, where's Doug, if you stand up, please, you know, and is Reed here? Is Reed here? No, okay, Reed and Doug, there are our two new council members for the next three years, okay, so uh, thank you, Doug, you can be seated, okay, and you know, and I want to just encourage you to, Bob isn't feeling too good, Bob Brewer isn't feeling too good, I know Paul, what do we hear about Paul, not good, okay, keep the Blatchford family in your prayers here, uh, and you know, I'm sure there's others about that, you know, and, and I really want, as crazy as this may sound to you, but I want to thank you for making 2020 a great year, doesn't that sound crazy, but I tell you what, our church grew spiritually, our church grew numerically, and our church grew financially. And I'm telling you what, it's a miracle, okay? And, but one thing I do realize in life, God just doesn't drop miracles seemingly out of heaven randomly. You know what he does? He uses people. And I want to tell you, thank you so much for being used of God in 2020. And yeah, I think so, yes. You know, and, and I'm very proud and excited about that, okay? And you know what? I'm excited about God, what God's going to do for us in 2021. And we're just going to keep letting the light out. Amen. And, and also, Brenda is starting a ladies Bible study. And so if you want, Brenda, wave your hand. Okay, yeah. That's Brenda. So if you, and so is Gwen. Okay, Gwen, raise your hand. Where's Gwen? Over here. Okay. So, you know, if, ladies, if you'd like to be involved with that, you know, 
uh, talk to Gwen or, or Brenda, okay? Uh, Gwen's is in the morning before services. Brenda's is on Wednesday evening, okay? So however that may suit you, uh, we appreciate that, amen? And you know, and I just wanted to tell you once again, thank you. And I just know that God has a lot of wonderful things going on. Remember, I, I was just talking to Wade, a Reed coming, he's, he, he's in his two-week quarantine, I guess. That's what you do when you get there. And so he's not, you know, out training quite yet, but he's down at Fort Benning. And you know, and, and you got to love Reed, you really do. I mean, I'm glad he loves doing it, you know, wanting to be a ranger, you know, because he's going he's gonna to have to do his mount repelling training. So you're jumping off mountains on ropes. Okay, hallelujah, you know. The only kid I think I'd like to do that around here is probably Gunner. He'd do that, okay, you know. But the other thing is, and then when he gets done with that, when, it's, when it starts to warm up, then they're going to go to Florida, and he has to finish his swamp training. You know what's in swamps? Alligators and snakes and all those wonderful things in life, okay? God bless the, the United States Army for keeping us str- uh, safe, okay, hallelujah. But, but, you know, keep reading your prayers that way, too. And, you know, and it was amazing for Reed what happened for him when he was in basic training. God used him to be a leader. And I believe God's going to use him again to be a, a leader in this ranger school, amen? And I just want to once again tell you, thank you. Why don't we just, you know, put your hands on the kids. Let's pray blessings on our kids, okay? We, we like to pray our, for our kids' blessings, okay? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for our young people and our young adults here at Christ the King and those watching via the webcam. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would just continue to keep them safe, Lord God. Keep them safe physically, Lord God. Keep them safe mentally. Keep them safe spiritually, Lord God. And I thank you and I praise you that we as parents and we as grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and friends and neighbors, Lord God, that we just pray a hedge of protection around our, our young people, Lord. And we, we just want to speak loud, devil, you'll not have our young people in the name of Jesus. That, Lord God, a thousand may fall at their left and ten thousand right, but, Lord God, you're going to keep them in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for that. And, Lord, I thank you and I praise you for just the, the, just the, the loyalty and just the, uh, the, just the blessings that people continue to bring their tithes, their gifts, their offerings into the storehouse via PayPal, through the mail, Lord God, and in person. We just pray a hundredfold return back on those families, Lord God, for their generosity and for their obedience to plant good seed and good ground. And all God's people said, amen. amen. We're going to dismiss the kids to go downstairs, the little ones, okay? And if you would, please turn your Bibles over to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. You know, today we're going to start on the different names of God involving Jehovah, okay? And we're going to start with Jehovah Jireh. Everybody say that with me. Jehovah Jireh. Well, we also found out in life, in reality, if we wanted to be real good Hebrews, it wouldn't be Jehovah Jireh because they don't pronounce J's. J's are Y's. So it would really be Jehovah Jireh, okay? They don't pronounce J's either. They have yes, uh, they have Y's. And so my name is Yep, okay, okay? And it's so funny because Hannah has a friend, and his name is, we'd call him Jess, but in Danish, he's Yes. And, and, we, and they'd call him Yes, and I'd think, well, that's kind of a weird name to be Yes, but I, I'd rather have a name Yes than No, I guess, hallelujah, okay? But so Jehovah Jireh, okay? And, it, it's, and why we're going to start with Jehovah Jireh, because first and foremost, it's found in Genesis, and Genesis is the book of the beginnings, and second, because I believe we're going to study at least six or seven more names of Jehovah. I think all these names actually come out of the name Jehovah Jireh. I don't think it's a coincidence that God revealed himself through Jehovah Jireh before all the other names of Jehovah. Because I think everything comes out of Jehovah Jireh. What do I mean by that? The, the word Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide, okay, what you have need of, or God is the provider. See, if you need hell, uh, healing, what's he going to do? He's going to provide for you healing, okay? So that name is Jehovah Rapha, okay? If you need a covering, our banner, you know what God says? That he'll provide for you. His name is Jehovah Nisi. If you need peace in your heart, Jehovah uh, shows himself as Jehovah Shalom, God, the Lord our peace. If you and I need direction in our life, he reveals himself as Jehovah Shalom, which means the shepherd, okay? If you need righteousness in your life, which we do, then he's revealed himself as Jehovah Sidkenu. And if you need compassion in your life, he reveals himself as the Lord is present. See, but it all starts, I think, Jehovah Jireh is the trunk. And then they all, the provisions come in many different ways. 
So let's go over to Genesis chapter 22. It says, Now it came to pass after these things, in Genesis 22, 1, that God tested Abraham. You know, it's amazing in life. Some of our kids are, you know, you're in school, you're a senior, whatever. You say, I can't wait to get out of school. You know what? You're always going to have tests. Abraham here was in his hundreds, and he was still getting a test, okay? God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham! And Abraham said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son. Everybody say only. Your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains to which I will tell you. It's interesting here. Anybody who's ever had any kids, some days it'd be easier to offer your kids on their sacrifice than others. Amen. You know, some days you say, yeah, Lord, here am I. You know, where are we going now? Okay, but we know a parent loves their kids as much as anything. And you know what? And didn't God recognize that with him? He said, the son you love. And we're going to talk about that. Okay. Abraham, it's interesting. Abraham had shown Jehovah that he had loved him more than his father by moving away from Ur of the Chaldees. And now Jehovah was requiring him to show him once again that his love for him, Jehovah, was greater than his son. See, years earlier, God came to Abraham and said, now I want you to leave Ur of the Chaldees, and he did. He was showing God he loved him more than his father. Now, years later, the test comes, do you love me more than your son? And what kind of son? Your only son. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37. These are the words of Jesus. He who loves father and mo or mother more than me, everybody say more. More than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more, everybody say more. Than me is not worthy of me. See, did God say you shouldn't love your parents? No. Did God say you shouldn't love your children? No. But God says we can't love our spouse, we can't love our parents, we can't love our kids, we can't love our family more than we love God. Why is that? Because God said in Exodus, he said what? Thou shalt have no other gods before him. Did God say we shouldn't love our family? No. I don't want anybody walking out here today saying, you know what? Pastor Jeff said, I shouldn't love my husband. I shouldn't love my mom and dad. I shouldn't love my kids. It's easy to love your grandkids, isn't it? Hallelujah. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's easy. Okay. But no, God says we can't love them more. Everybody say more. more. God did not reprimand, uh, repr uh, uh, reprimand Abraham for loving Isaac. He said, the, the son you love. God didn't say, and you shouldn't do that. He just saying you shouldn't love anything or anybody more than the Lord. See, you know why? Parents are our past. Amen? Our spouses are our present. Our children are our future. Okay? You know, I might have told you a story, but we have a friend of ours back in, in uh, Bullhead City, Arizona. They, they had one child, and when she was in her 20s, she committed suicide. Sad. Sad. And I remember talking to the dad, and he said, and, he, and I only their only daughter no kids no grandchildren he said your parents are your past your spouse is your present but your kids are your future and he was basically saying we don't have much of a future because we don't have a child so what i'm saying is god is telling us we need to love him even more than our future okay and that's very very important okay god calls abraham and when abraham answered i'm sure abraham thought that Jehovah was going to renew one of his promises. Because if you read up through Genesis 22, God is coming to Abraham and saying, you know what, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed by you. I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. So you know what, when God brings up Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm sure, you know what, Abraham's thinking, what's the more goodies that God's going to tell me? Come on, wouldn't you? And then all of a sudden, God hits him out of left field, okay? And he says, when God speaks to us, you know what I realize? It's not always what we think it's going to be about. Has that ever happened to you in this? Have you ever maybe had a conversation with a friend and you, they said, hey, I'd like to talk to you, and they just come out of left field, and you think, wow, that's not what I was expecting. Well, you know what? This is what happened to Abraham. He did not think that God was going to ask him to sacrifice his only son. 
I'm sure he thought he was going to get another blessing from God. But in reality, it really is a blessing. Because then you know, we're going to find out. See, we know Genesis 22. Abraham had to walk that out. We already know the end of it. But he realized that what? It is a blessing to know that you and I have nothing or anybody before our God. But he says there, he says, take your only son. You know what? Abraham was a rich man. But you know what? God didn't ask him for a bull or a lamb. He was wondering how willing would Abraham have parted, uh, how willing would Abraham be to part with Isaac, with Isaac. But you know what I love about our Savior Jesus and our Father God? He's never going to ask us to do something he hasn't already done. The Bible tells us he was tempted like us in all ways yet without sin. And you know what? And so here comes God, God the Father says to Abraham, he says, I want you to take your only son. What verse does that sound like in the New Testament? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only. Everybody say only. only. See, God wasn't asking Abraham to do something he wasn't willing to do himself. You know, it's amazing. Like the best leaders in the world are the ones that are willing to get in the trenches and fight with you anyway. Not the ones that are commanding you. I, I've always thought, I wonder in our culture today, all these things going on in our world, I wonder if all these leaders of all these different movements, we just say, no, you guys fight it out with each other and just leave us on the sideline. No, they, they don't mind sacrificing your, your job, your finances, your children, your future. They want theirs yet. Do you understand? But God wasn't and isn't that way. He was willing to give up his only son so he could ask Abraham to do the same thing. Amen? You know what's amazing about Abraham and, and the timing? Have you ever thought sometimes God timing is off? I have, okay? You know, have you ever said, God, you know, if you would have showed up about three days earlier, it would have been better. Or God, if you wouldn't bother me right now, I got something going on, you know, in the next week. But, you know, because what makes this timing so difficult for Abraham, if you're reading your Bible, if you just put it in reverse and go back a couple of verses, God just, Abraham just kicked out his other son, Ishmael, out of the house. And Hagar, his mom. Now, you know what? Wouldn't it have been amazing? So here, maybe, I don't know, a time before, here he had two sons. Now he loses one because Ishmael was making fun of Isaac. And then Sarah came and said, you know what? The, you need to get rid of that woman who's making fun of the child of promise. So I'm sure it broke Abraham's heart. Meryl and I lived in the desert. And when you send someone out in the desert, folks, it's not good news. Okay, and so what they did is uh, Abraham gave him some food and some water and he had to send him out in the desert. So here Abraham has just lost one of his sons. And now God is saying, now your only son. Okay, Ishmael had just been recently cast out and ha with Hagar and now only Isaac was left. I don't know about you, it's happened to Meryl and I before many times. The Lord will ask me to come and say, Jeff, would you give somebody a $10 bill? Or whatever. You put the amount in. And you look in there. What do you have? One $10 bill. Come on. Am I talking to you or just me? Hallelujah. Okay. And you're thinking, you know, Lord, if you would have got to me before I went in and bought that number five at McDonald's, I could have had a couple more and it wouldn't hurt me so bad. Come on. But, you know, see, but God's timing isn't wrong. He's checking our hearts. He's checking our hearts. Okay. When, when you and I seem to have lost something precious and now more is required of us, we can either let it destroy us. Can you imagine how mad Abraham could have been? Come on. You know, God, I just got rid of my other son. Now you want me to get rid of this one, the son of promise. You know what? Abraham could have got mad. And you know what? I have seen Christians get mad at God. And you know what? It doesn't help. So we either can let it destroy us or we can let it bring us closer to him and worship. I don't know about you, but when I get to the point where I can't handle something, you either get mad or you can worship. Abraham decided, I'm going to go and worship. Okay, let's go in verses 3 through 5. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to the young men, 
stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship. And see, this is a man of faith, and we will come back to you. He didn't say I would. He said we will. I am positive. Abraham didn't know how this was all going to work out, but he was just going to trust God. Are you in a situation today where you're thinking, I don't know how this is going to work out. God, this, this is looking bad on me. I don't know how it's going to work out, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to trust you. Look at what it says over in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered. This is after King Nebuchadnezzar built a great big idol. And he says, when you hear the trumpet sound, you got to fall down and worship them. And, the, and, the, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they basically said, we will not bow. We would rather burn than bow. Okay, that's, and it says, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this manner. I love these boys. See, these boys had decided before they ever were called before the principal's office. They knew what they were going to say. See, folks, we got to decide and settle something in our heart before we get there. Because, yes. see, if we think we're going to decide it when the pressure's on us, we're going to cave in. We got to decide, you know what, if this is what's going to happen, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to trust the Lord. Because, like I said, we have no need to answer you. I love this. And you know what, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were not, they were not disrespectful to the king. If that is the case, our God, whom we, are, whom we serve, is able. Everybody say, is able. able. To deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, everybody say, if not. If not, if not let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor do we worship the gold image which you have set up. See, folks, death is not the worst that will happen to us. Death without Christ is unimaginable. Death is not the worst. You know, who wants to go to heaven and raise their hand? Come on. Well, most of you, hallelujah. Okay, hallelujah. Well, we'll work on the rest of you, okay? But you know what? Unless Jesus comes back, unless the trumpet is sound in the skies, and those that are dead in Christ arise, and then we are alive, we're caught up in You know how we're getting to heaven? We're going to die. That's great news. I'm glad I came to church. Hallelujah. Pastor said, I'm going to die. Well, we're going to die unless Jesus comes back. And you know what? So death is not the worst thing. Death without Christ is the worst thing. You know, I, I laugh. I don't laugh. I think it's ironic. Over in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, this is the Apostle Paul. You know, Apostle Paul, he, he wrote this letter to, Phil, to the church at Philippi in jail. He said, for me to live is Christ. Get that. But to die is gain. Wait. For me to live is Christ, but for me to die is gain. What was Paul saying? If I die, it's gain. I don't think Paul was running around with, you know, with this sadistic point of view thinking he wanted to die. Do you understand? But he was just putting it in perspective. We are sojourners in this world. You know that? We're not, this is not our home. I've always tried to tell people this way. You know, this is kind of like a cabin, and heaven is our real home. And even though, if you go to Lake Okoboji, some people got some really nice cabins up there, okay? They're not cabins, they're homes. But for the most part, cabins are rustic, and they're little, they don't have all the things of home. You like to visit there, it's fun to go home and you have your running water, your hot water, all those things. See, you want to go back home where it's nicer. See, heaven is nicer than this. This is just my cabin that I'm living into. But someday, I'm going to go back, and you know what? Jesus is making a mansion for you and I. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I. He said, if it was not so, I would have told you that. So we're finding out here that what? That we need to be positive and that Abraham says that he looked off from afar. What do you think that conversation was those three days? I, I, I don't know. I'm sure it wasn't easy for Abraham, okay? And verse 6, so Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his on Isaac his son. Now you got to remember Isaac here is a teenager late teens. His dad is in the hundreds. I think he could probably take his dad. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now I remember when my son was 
when my son was probably in ninth grade, tenth grade, that's when they get real lippy, you know what I'm saying? And they think they can whip dad easy. And I remember what I would do is when I'd wrestle, I knew he had more stamina than I. I knew that. So when we'd wrestle, I would just lay on top of him. And I would just get relaxed and let my weight work for me. Hallelujah. He said, Dad, I can't breathe. I said, yes, you can. You wouldn't be talking to me, okay? And I'd just lay there on him, okay? What am I saying is, if it really came into a lot of tussle, probably the younger one's going to beat the older one. But isn't it amazing Isaac was obedient to his father? And it says here, and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. Isaac was to carry the wood for the burnt offering upon his back. Now, if we'll look forward several thousand years ago. Look what it says in John 19, 17. And he, Jesus, bearing his cross, went to a place called the place of skulls, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. Jesus was carrying his own wood for his sacrifice. See, what I learned from that is when we come to worship Jehovah, make sure you and I bring everything that we can bring, and God will provide the rest. See, when you and I are going to come to worship Jesus, let's make sure we take everything we can. See, Abraham and Isaac brought everything they could, and then they knew God would provide. In verse 7 and 8, And Isaac spoke to his dad Abraham and said, my, my father, and he said, Here am I, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac wasn't some stupid kid. Verse 8, And Abraham said, I love this. Dads, this is what we have to impart to our kids. And he said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering so the two of them went together dads what can we teach our kids more than anything else trust god trust god abraham didn't know how it was working they had the fire they had the wood they had the knife they had everything but the sacrifice and he knew unless god didn't show up that's what his son was going to be but he trusted God. Am I talking? Have you ever wanted to run away from God? Come on. This is too hard. And you know what? We're going to find out when we do run away from God, when it gets too hard, then we never get to know him as our provider. Okay? Very important. Okay? See, one word describes this conversation between father and son. Trust. Trust between, get this, trust between a father and his son. That's important. But just as important, trust between a father and his God. Not just between a son and a father, but a father and his God. As parents, the most precious thing we can give to our kids as an inheritance is that they can learn to trust Jehovah. Why? Because you know what? When this world doesn't make sense, okay? When your life doesn't make sense, when things all around you are spinning out of control, we need to be able to put our trust and our faith into someone that cares for and is committed to us. And his name is Jesus. I have your faith in the heart should exhibit obedience in the flesh. Faith in the heart should exhibit obedience in the flesh. Why don't we say, you hear people say, I believe God all they want. Then if you and I believe God, it will be exhibited in the flesh. Does that make sense? You can't just talk the good talk. We have to walk the good walk. And then it says here in verse 9, and it says, So they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abram built the altar there and placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And they came to the place. Everybody say the place. The place is really important, okay? Partial obedience is not obedience at all. How do I know this? Kids, when your mom and dad ask you to go clean your room, and what you do is you run in there, and you take all your toys and junk, and you throw them under the bed, you throw them in the closet, and all that, and your mom and dad come and say, did you clean your room? Yes, I sure did. And you walk in there, and you look underneath the bed, and you open up the closet, and what do you see? All the junk. Did they really clean their room? No. See, partial obedience is no obedience. See, if your parents tell you to clean your room, they mean clean your room. Amen? When God tells us he wants us to be obedient, he doesn't believe in partial 
obedience, okay? See, if we need Jehovah to be our provider, we need to be at the place that he's ordained us to be. See, it, God told Abraham, he saw the mountain from afar off, and God said, go to that mountain. There are all other mountains all around there, saints. But God said, go to that mountain. Are you like me sometimes? Well, God, there's easier, there's mountains closer. Why don't I go to this mountain? It's closer. And God says, no, I want you to go to that mountain. Because you know what? What happens if Abraham would have went to the mountain closest to him? Would God have been obligated to send a ram up the other side of that mountain? No. Abraham would have missed out on the provision of the Lord. Not because God didn't provide for him. It's because he was not at that place. See, obedience is very, very important, okay? You know, I always think about this. Dad, could you imagine what would it be like if you had to offer up one of your kids and you had to face your wife when you got home? How about if the wife says, sweetheart, where's Isaac? Where's our only son? Where's our child of promise? Don't you think those things had to be going through Abraham's mind? See, he had to trust God, okay? What, uh, with what faith can he return to his wife and his family with the blood of Isaac sprinkled on his garments? Indeed, Isaac, get this, was Abraham's darling. He was Sarah's laughter, and he was the child of the promise. Now, I know we all think our kids are that. They're not, hallelujah, okay? I know that life. Okay, Dean, he laughed pretty good on that one, okay? Sorry, Evan, okay? No. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? Those are all the things that he had dreams and get. Don't you and I have dreams and visions for our kids and our grandkids? We sure do. But what happens if God says, no, that's not what we want? How do you face each other? You know, it's hard. Sometimes it is hard following the Lord. Sometimes you and I have to follow the Lord in spite of what other people might say to us to do. You know, today, I don't know if you happen to read your devotion today. I was reading it about Kirby Puckett. Anybody know who Kirby Puckett is? Yeah, he was a great center fielder for the Minnesota Twins. And I thought it was so interesting in that they're talk, he was talking about, and he said, you know, childhood, every kid played baseball. What do you want to win? The World Series. So here they win the World Series, and everybody's celebrating and after 10 minutes, Kirby Puckett's over in the corner. And, and the guy said, Greg Gagne said, I could see sadness in his eyes. He says, is this what it's about? Folks, I got news for you. If you think the world is going to give you lasting satisfaction, Rod Stewart put it best. Can't get no satisfaction. You don't get it from the world. I don't care what kind of accolades you think you get in life. They come I got news for you. Bless our kids that won state championships here in Ponca. Youth in 10 years, probably most of the young kids don't even know who those kids were on a state championship team that are in elementary. And you know what? Because the world is passing. There's nothing wrong with those things. You know, I remember Akeem Elijah won when he won two oh, NBA championships with the Houston Rockets and the confetti is coming down. NBA champions. And I remember they came and they talked to him and he said the same thing with all the confetti coming down. He said, is this it? The world isn't going to give you a lasting satisfaction. In fact, in our devotion, it said this morning, Solomon said it's all vanity. And then Solomon got the answer and it alludes to what we're talking about today in Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not unto your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all his ways, and he'll lead and guide and direct your path. See, there's nothing wrong with those other things, those accolades, but they will never be more than fleeting moments. And you know what? We need to teach our families. We're about eternal things here. Yeah. We're going to love God first. Then those other things, you know what? They're wonderful in life, but they're fleeting, so very fleeting. Let's go in verse 10. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. God, by his word, calls us to part with all that we have for Christ. Are you and I willing to let our future, our dreams, for the cause of Christ die? You know, Paul said over in Philippians, you know, Paul, you know, we read about Paul, and he, he's such a huge figure in the New Testament. But you know how much he gave up? Paul, the Bible tells us, he was part of the Sanhedrin. You know what, the, maybe you don't know what the Sanhedrin is. 
That was part of the 70 people that ran Israel. Paul was a bigwig. And Paul, when he came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, he gave it off. In fact, we don't know this from Scripture, but if we know about the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin, if you were a member of the Sanhedrin, you were supposed to be married. So there's maybe even a good chance that Paul was married. But for the cause of Christ, look at what it says here in Philippians 3, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And what does he do? And count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Paul had all the trophies. You know, he had been voted best little Pharisee of his class. You know what I'm saying? You know, he had been voted this and that. He had all the little trophies. And Paul said, you know what? I count them all as lost for Jesus. Now, I know some people, maybe some people watch it, maybe some people think, yeah, that's a little radical, isn't it? Well, maybe it is. I don't know. I don't think it is, because if Jesus was willing to do all this for me, can I do something for him? See, these things are all fleeting moments. You know, you guys have been so good to Marilyn and I. You really have. And I appreciate all the compliments you give us, all the words of encouragement. You get, and I do, I, I never take those things for granted. I never do. And I want to tell you thank you for those. But I do tell people this. The thing that I'm looking the most for is when I die and I meet my Jesus and he looks at me and he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. All the other accolades will come and go, but that's the one that's going to stay for all of eternity. That's my passion. You know, I love it when you guys come up and tell me I do a good job. Better than tell me I did a bad job, okay? You know what I'm saying? Hey, preacher, why don't you get excited a little bit, okay? You know, or something like that. But you know, the fact of the matter is, I want to hear those words from Jesus from my life. Because you know how long heaven is? For eternity. You know, hey, I'm glad you can hit the ball. I'm glad you can shoot the duck. I'm glad you can, you know, you can hit the ball in the hole. That's wonderful. But when you get to heaven, I don't think Jesus is going to come and say, you know, you know what? Uh, you really played a good round of golf, you know? They're not, you, know you know what I found out? I used to golf all the time. And I loved it. I, I golfed in college. I did all those things. And you know what I found out in life? If I came home and I was so excited, I'd shoot a, let's say, a 35. I'd come home and tell my wife, i say, Marilyn, guess what? I shot a 35. She'd say, so? I thought, well, I was excited. I shot a 35, okay? Then if I'd come home and I told Marilyn, I'd be mad. I'd say, man, I shot a 45. She'd say, so? Then I realized, she really doesn't care, does she? Hallelujah, okay? What I'm saying is, it's just something that's very fleeting. Do you understand what I'm saying? But if I come home and I tell her what Jesus has meant to me, what Jesus has showed me, she gets excited about those things. She really does. And we need to do that with our kids. Your kids make the winning shot. That's wonderful. Applaud them. Tell them, great job. But don't let them think that's the end of their life. That's the best part of their life. How about when they come home and they tell you, you know what, Mom and Dad, I led my classmate to Jesus. You know, Mom and Dad, I started a Bible study. You know, Mom and Dad, I was able to share Jesus with that one. That's when we should get excited and say, you know what, that's wonderful. That's what you were created to do. Amen. Those are the things that get the Lord excited. And let's, in verse 11, it said, But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here am I. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad, nor do anything to him. For, look at what, for now I know, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Actions speak louder than words. I'm sure that Abraham had told Jehovah many times he had loved Jehovah more than anything and anybody, but now his actions confirmed his words. Now his action confirmed his words. Like most of us, we don't like tests. You know why? Because tests don't lie. You know what tests do? You either pass it or you fail it, okay? If you pass the test, it shows what you've accomplished and what are you getting ready for? The next test, okay? And if you and I fail the test, it shows us what areas we need to improve on. God knew, God knew Abraham loved him more than Isaac. God knew it. But now Abraham had his own evidence that he loved God more than he loved his own. God already knew it. 
He wanted Abraham to know it so he could continue to be that friend with God. The best evidence of fearing God is our being willing to serve and to honor him with what is dearest to us and to part with all if required. You know, I, I tell the story, you know, Marilyn and I, we owned our, our home in Indiana. And when we sold it, we had about $140,000 because we owned our home. And, and we never spent it. We, we kept that money for over 10 years and never touched a dime of it. Why would we? I mean, we were getting... 0.25 interest on it, hallelujah. Why would I want to spend that money when it would turn out all that interest, okay? But the fact of the matter, that's where my banker here, friend, okay? But, but the fact of the matter is, when we went to Arizona, like I said, through some things, we had to go to the hospital, kidney stones, gallbladder removed, switched insurances, pre-existing uh, situations, so they didn't pay for any of it. So Meryl and I, we got a bill for $95,000 from the hospital that said, this is what you're responsible for. I had told the Lord many times, Lord, you know that $140,000 I have? That's yours, it's not mine. And then when that bill came due, I said, you know what, Lord? Meryl and I, we wanted to save that money to build a house when we, we built one here. Still paying for it, but we built it. And I said, but Lord, I know you want me to pay my bills. And if you want, I've told you that money is yours. And it's easier to tell you that money is yours when I don't have a $95,000 bill waiting for me. But I said, Lord, it's yours. And if that's what it's going to take, I'm going to do it. And I had to trust him. And I was talking to the business manager. I told her what had happened to me when I had got my, ball, my gallbladder removed. It was a terrible, it was a night from hell in the hospital. But I, but I never complained about it to the hospital. I just told it to the business manager. She said, Jeff, you should never have endured that. She said, let me talk to the CEO of the hospital. So she talked to the CEO of the hospital. About a week later, she called me. She says, Jeff, that $95,000 you owe, if you'll pay $5,000, we'll relieve the ninety. dollars I didn't have to pray about it. I said, I'll do it. <laughs> I didn't have to pray about it. I was kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I, I already know my answer, hallelujah. But I had to trust Jesus. And you know what, folks? It was hard. I wish I could tell you I was a great man of God. Well, I never feared. I had no doubt. I wish I could tell you that, but I'd be lying. But I had to trust God. And you know what? I don't know what situation you're in today. But you know what? It's scary to trust the Lord, but it's scary not to. And I want to encourage you to learn to trust in the Lord. What did Abraham learn from himself through this test or trial? He was not simply a worshiper of God. He was a God-fearing man. Didn't, isn't that what God said? Now I know you fear me. Test reveal things. Look what it says in 13 and 14. Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide our Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh, for he said, in the mouth of the Lord it shall be provided. As the ram was sacrificed instead of Isaac, so Christ was sacrificed for our sins instead of us. If you and I want the Lord to be our Jehovah Jireh, we must be willing to up, offer up all that we are, all that we hope to be, and be at the right place at the right time. Why? Because you know what? As Abraham and Isaac we're climbing up Mount Moriah. God was orchestrating a ram climbing up Mount Moriah on the opposite side. And I believe with all my heart, with each step that Abraham and Isaac took, one step the ram took. Each step. In fact, maybe the ram was a little behind because they tied up Isaac and they were ready to sacrifice him. But do you understand? See, Abraham decided he was going to trust God. And then because of that, God became his provider. See, if we're not going to trust God, he won't be our provider. He'll say, you know what? You want to be your provider? You be your provider. Or I can be your provider. See, the choice is ours. And, we, and I don't know about you. I wish I could tell you I answer that correctly every day, but some days I don't. Some days it's harder than other days. But I realize in life I have to trust God. Because if I don't, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to miss the provision of the Lord. 
I've heard people say, God doesn't provide for us. Yes, he does. Maybe you were just climbing up the wrong mountain. Because our God's promises are yes and amen. Were you willing to offer your Isaac? See, if we're not willing to offer our Isaac what's dear and precious to us, then God will not be our provider. Because, you know what? Until that day, what do you think Abraham all had all of his provisions into? His son. When he got old, his son would take care of him. You know, he was his provider. God said, no, I want to be your provider. Let's finish the last verse. He said, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done, what? He put action to his faith, this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son. Look at what he says. Oh, this is God. Blessings, I will bless you. Woo! That's good, hallelujah. Tell your face that's good, hallelujah. Okay, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Tell your face it's good, okay? Amen. That's good. Amen. See, God wants to be your provider. Because when he's your provider, he's going to bless you with blessings. And he says, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies. And your seed, look at this, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because you have obeyed my voice. Blessings come with obedience. If we don't obey, we don't get God's blessings. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. He loves you unconditionally. But the blessings are, and it says, so Abraham returned with his young man. Don't you think when Abraham went back, I bet you him and Isaac were flying, hallelujah. They had seen the provision of the Lord, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and, and, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. The word Beersheba means, it actually means the, the well of seven, or the water of seven. I tell you what, Instead of going back and having to face uh, Sarah and say what happened to their son, he got to go back and tell Sarah, you wouldn't believe when I saw God. Maybe he was a smart man. He left out some of the details. Like, you know, I took your son. I wrapped him up, put him on the altar, and I was ready to kill him. I, I'd probably left that out, Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? Because she might not have been so excited about the other part, okay? But can you imagine? He went back, and he had a revelation, something he had never experienced of God before. Because he's willing and obedient. I can ask the worship team to come on up. And you know what? Is it easy? No, saints, it isn't. Is it rewarding? Yes. Yes, it is. And you know, I don't know what maybe you might be struggling with today. I want you to know, would you just trust Jesus? Would you just trust Jesus? Would I, I'm going to have you stand up, please. Remember, it's not that God doesn't want you to love people. He just wants to make sure that we love him more than anything and anybody. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to have a good paying job and supplying for your family. He just wants you to realize he's the one that gave you that job that's meeting the needs of your family. I want you to know, I tell you, it would be myself for my family. But I tell you what, it's, there's a lot less pressure and stress if I know, you know what, I'm just a vessel in God's hand. Yes, God's using me, but it's still God's provision that is meeting my family's needs, not my own. Because see, the Bible says in Philippians, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. See, there's no unending of God's blessings, but there is an ending to mine. Would we be willing to give God our best right now? Young and old. This is not a message just for us old people. This is a message for young people. Are you willing to empty yourself, so to speak, and say, Lord, I give you my life? I've told you the story. You know, when I was growing up, my mother wanted me to be a business person. I was going to go into business. I was going to make a lot of money. And God had a different plan for my life. And when Meryl and I got married, it was during our wedding ceremony that we felt the call of God to go into the ministry. And, I, and you know what? And I've never been disappointed because of it. Has there been hard times? Yes. But I tell you what, we've always seen God provide. You know, I, I could tell you stories, and I know most of you could too, about how you had nothing and 
how you started with nothing and how some days you really wondered, you know, where we we're going to get this, how we we're going to pay for that. And it just seemed like the provision of the Lord was always enough. One of my funnest stories I ever tell is when I went to, when we went to Oral Roberts University, I went to a, a, a meeting with an evangelist and they were passing the offering plate around. I'll never forget, Meryl and I, we were poor as church mice. We really were. And I remember the offering plate got ready to go around and I had two quarters in my pocket, two quarters. I remember it. I got those quarters out of my pocket and I thought, this guy doesn't need 50 cents. And I wasn't going to put it in. But you know what? When the bucket came by, I put those 50 cents in. And I went home that day, opened up my mailbox, and there was a check in there for $50. I've told you, my first thought wasn't amen and hallelujah. My first thought was, I wish I would have put a buck in there. Okay. <laughs> that was my first thought. Okay. <laughs> but I thank Jesus for his provision. And Meryl and I have seen that happen so many times. I know you have. This church has. And you know what? As God blesses us, we never want to lose our trust in him. Because I tell you what, he blesses us with things, not so, not so we can say we don't need him anymore so we can bless others. Because of Abraham's act of faith, you and I are blessed. Because it said that all the nations of the earth will be blessed because of Abraham's obedience. I want to encourage us as dads, as grandparents, as uncles and aunts, and moms. I want to encourage us. Let's make sure we're being obedient so the blessings of God can flow from us to our families, to our children, to our great-grandchildren, maybe to our great-great-grandchildren. Because you know what? They can be blessed because of us. And let's teach them to trust Jesus with their hearts. Amen. Amen. King of my heart, be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, for he is my let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom from my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good. my sins, the anger in my ways, oh, it's my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, it's my song. You are good.
close your eyes and those watching by the web and here, you know, Jesus has provided for us a way out of sin and he's our savior. And maybe there's someone in here today that's never made Jesus the Lord of their life. Maybe someone watching via the internet. If you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, I want you to know Jehovah Jireh has provided for you. He's saying you don't have to live in this in the muck and the mire. You don't have to live in your sin. But Jesus has made a way where there seems to be no way. If you and I would just confess him with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the Bible says we shall be saved. You see, it doesn't matter how many times we go to church. It doesn't matter how much we watch on the, on the camera, on the video and all this. See, we need to make a quality decision to say, Jesus, come into my life. And if you've never made that decision, I'm just going to give you a few moments right there where you're at. And just say to yourself, Jesus, come into my life. I take you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for being my Jehovah Jireh. For the provision of the Lord is enough to redeem me from the muck and the mire and set my feet on solid ground. To redeem me from darkness and set my feet on light. To redeem me from, from disappointments to victory. Our God is big enough. And if you believe that and you confess with your mouth, number one, I want you to tell somebody else and just let them know what you did. And I want you to know that, you know, write me a letter, maybe come and talk to me or whatever. And we are excited because the Bible says there's only one thing in heaven that gets the angels excited. Only one thing in heaven that they throw a party. And it says when someone makes Jesus Christ the Lord of life, the Bible says the angels rejoice in heaven. I want you to know, let's make heaven rejoice. Would you put your hands towards heaven as I get ready to bless you with the ironic blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, his children, and give you his shalom, his peace. And all God's people said, amen. And I just want to remind you, come out to the park if you could at 3 o'clock. We'd love to have you. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen? Thank you.